It's about that time again. This week at Starbase, construction continues on Ship 39 and Booster 18, Pad 1 demolition rolls on, and Pad 2 grows ever closer to coming online. What kind of progress was made this week, and how's testing going on all the systems at the new pad? Let's dig into this week's update and find out. Starting off with our fabrication updates, this week saw significant progress on Ship 39, the first Block 3 starship. Two sections of the rocket's liquid oxygen tank were moved from the Star Factory to Mega Bay 2, where they were joined with the already stacked upper portion of the vehicle. Later in the week, an installation jig loaded with the four methane downcomers was also brought out of Star Factory and taken to Mega Bay 2 for Ship 39. The large central tube supplies methane to the center three engines, while the three smaller tubes are for each of the vacuum raptors. A few hours later, the downcomer that feeds liquid oxygen from the header tank down to the sea level raptors was lifted and joined the other tubes in the installation jig. On Friday, the assembled portion of Ship 39 was lifted and lowered over the jig so the tubes can be welded to the ship. On Wednesday, in Mega Bay 1, the two halves of Booster 18 were finally joined, completing stacking operations of the first Block 3 Super Heavy. A Block 3 ship aft section was rolled out of Star Factory Thursday, and on Friday it made its way into Mega Bay 2 for stacking of a test tank for this newest version of Starship. Later on Friday morning, the forward section of the test article was brought over to the ship assembly bay. Early the next morning, it was lifted and stacked onto the previously delivered aft section, likely completing stacking for this new test tank. Ship 40's nose cone and Ship 43's common dome section were also spotted this week through the Star Factory windows. Just goes to show how many Starships SpaceX is working on in parallel at any one point in time. Elsewhere at the build site, crews continue making steady progress on the construction of the Starbase Gigabay. Steel columns and interconnecting beams are now being installed on both sides of the massive building. Meanwhile, even as that steelwork progresses, crews were striving to finish assembling the final two tower cranes to enable an even faster pace of construction. You know, as if fastest in the industry wasn't fast enough. Now down at the launch complex, SpaceX continues the rapid demolition of the outdated parts of the Pad 1 infrastructure. This week, we saw the removal of the liquid oxygen subcoolers, first from their place in the tank farm, and then from the launch complex altogether. Meanwhile, just a short distance away, crews began dismantling the Pad 1 launch mount piece by piece. This is a very labor-intensive project that involves cutting sections of the mount free and removing them one by one. But this process wasn't limited to the structure of the mount itself, it also included the booster quick disconnect structure on the top deck. That structure was cut into several sections that were then lifted free and lowered to the ground. The roof over the chopstick drawworks hoist was also removed from the base of the tower to make way for the reconfiguration of the pad. Later in the week, the drawworks winch itself was removed from the base of the tower and was later seen being driven away from the pad. It's likely that it will undergo some maintenance and eventually be reinstalled later in the reconfiguration process. Crews were also seen cutting on the chopsticks themselves, as the original Mechazilla arms are far longer than the newer iterations and will likely be replaced or at the very least heavily modified. Across the site at Pad 2, crews continue to button up the new launch mount, installing additional shielding on the infrastructure to protect it from the violent forces of a super heavy launch that Pad 1 is all too familiar with. Venting was seen from the Pad 2 side of the tank farm as SpaceX looks to ensure everything is functioning properly ahead of the first testing campaign for the Block 3 vehicles. Later in the week, testing was also seen from the Pad's deluge system, with water shooting up in the air and flooding the flame trench. An interesting structure was moved down to the launch complex on Thursday, bearing a label that called it Ibuprofen. This appears to be a new apparatus that will be used to test and verify that the booster clamp arms on Pad 2 function as designed. The next day, the Ibuprofen structure was lifted to the Pad 2 launch mount to begin the qualification process for the clamp arms. Speaking of mysterious structures, two more of them were delivered this week and were eventually taken inside of the Star Factory. Presumably, these are used in some step of fabrication, but it's not immediately clear to us what their exact function is. What do you think these are? Let us know in the comments down below. 
over at the Cape on Tuesday, SpaceX rolled the new Starship launch mount from the assembly area at Roberts Road to historic Launch Complex 39A. This mount looks to be more complete than the Starbase one when it was rolled to the pad in Texas. Not wasting any time, less than 24 hours after arriving at the pad, the mount was lifted by the massive LR-13000 crawler crane and maneuvered into position over the flame trench before being lowered onto the legs. On Thursday, four new horizontal storage tanks arrived at Port Canaveral on a barge and were brought up the Banana River to the Vehicle Assembly Building Turning Basin for offloading. On Friday, the tanks were rolled off of the barge to wait for transport, presumably to LC-39A. Switching over now to Falcon 9 operations, in the early hours of Sunday morning, the Bandwagon 4 mission lifted off from Space Launch Complex 40, carrying 18 payloads to low Earth orbit. Just minutes later, Booster 1091 lit its engines again as it came screaming back down out of the Florida skies and touched down at Landing Zone 2. We love RTLS landings, don't we? Less than four days after that, Slick 40 was active again as Booster 1094 lifted off for the Starlink Group 6-81 mission, carrying 29 satellites to orbit. The booster and fairing halves were successfully recovered and returned to Port Canaveral for processing. Thursday saw the only launch of the week from the West Coast as the Starlink Group 11-14 mission lifted off from Space Launch Complex 4E at Vandenberg Space Force Base with 28 more satellites for the Constellation. Booster 1093 and the fairing halves were recovered and returned to the coast for refurbishment as usual. In other space news, Echo Star announced that they have amended their agreement with SpaceX and will now sell them their full unpaired AWS 3 Spectrum license portfolio for $2.6 billion of SpaceX stock. This week, the Indian Space Research Organization launched the CMS-03 mission, sending a naval communications satellite on its way to geostationary transfer orbit. On Tuesday, the United Launch Alliance rolled out an Atlas V rocket to the pad at Space Launch Complex 41 in preparation for the Viasat 3 F2 mission. The launch was eventually scrubbed due to issues with the booster liquid oxygen tank vent valve. The next attempt is now expected to occur no sooner than late next week. Ariane Space launched the Sentinel-1D mission from the Guiana Space Center in South America. This satellite is part of the European Union's Copernicus program and will provide weather-penetrating imagery of the Earth's surface. Rocket Lab launched their The Nation God Navigates mission from Launch Complex 1B in New Zealand. This mission launched the QPS-SAR-14 satellite for IQPS, which, similar to the Sentinel-1D satellite actually, provides images of the Earth's surface even through cloud coverage. Back at the Cape on Wednesday, support ship Harvey Stone towed the New Glen landing barge Jacqueline out to sea in preparation for the launch of Escapade, which may or may not have occurred by the time this episode drops. On Friday, Blue Origin CEO Dave Limp posted that they had completed integration of the Escapade spacecraft to the New Glenn rocket ahead of that launch. Vast Space shared footage of their Haven Demo satellite, one of the payloads from SpaceX's Bandwagon 4 mission, successfully deploying its solar array as it prepares for its mission to prove out subsystems that Vast intends to fly on their upcoming space station. Astra shared video of ongoing testing of the first stage engine for their Rocket 4 vehicle as the company continues to accrue data and work towards a launch as soon as next year. These engines, called Chiron, are supplied by Firefly and are a variant of that company's Reaver engine. Axiom Space shared footage from the milling of a docking adapter as the company continues to build out hardware for their private space station. Intuitive Machines announced that they are acquiring Lanteris Space Systems, the spacecraft manufacturer formerly known as Maxar Space Systems, further expanding their capabilities and footprint in the space industry. And in other acquisition news, Firefly Aerospace is buying defense software company SciTech. This move helps round out Firefly's defense position, adding software knowledge and experience to their existing hardware expertise. Firefly also announced that they have received another payload for the second mission of their Blue Ghost lunar lander. The Rashid Rover 2 is the second rover from the United Arab Emirates to head to the moon. Its predecessor was part of the Hakuto-R Mission 1, which unfortunately failed to land safely. Finally for this week, because we have to talk about it, the FAA have announced restrictions that they are imposing on the American commercial space industry as a result of the ongoing shutdown of the federal government. Most notably, they are prohibiting commercial spaceflight activity between the hours of 6am and 10pm local time. 
Well, I know that's a bit of a somber note to end on, but hey, we had a lot of other exciting things happen this week, didn't we? And if you want to continue staying in touch with all the goings on here in the spaceflight world, be sure to click all those buttons down there and stick around here at Lab Padre. Until next time, this is Caden from Lab Padre, signing off.